Now let's finally see how we can use light to determine the chemical composition of celestial objects. Let's look at a simple atom, the simplest atom that's out there with an electron associated with it, the hydrogen atom. The hydrogen atom has one proton right there in, in, in the center and has an electron associated with it. Usually, the electron will be found right here at the lowest energy state, which is closest to the product. Now, the electron may be in, in one shell or a higher energy cell or a higher steel energy shell, but the electron is only allowed to be a certain specific shell. So the electron has to jump from here to here, from n equals 1 to n equals 2, or from n equals 1 to n equals 2, n equals 3, excuse me, or so forth. In order to do that, it needs to absorb the exact right amount of energy. The electron is not allowed to go anywhere in between these energy levels. So if a certain photon comes in and it has exactly the right amount of energy, the electron will jump. If, however, it has slightly more and slightly less, the electron will just say, get out of here. I, I don't want to deal with you. Very precise about what energy level this electron wants to jump from one level to the other. In order to move from n equals 1 to n equals 2, or 2 to 3, or 3 to 4, or 1 to 4, it needs to absorb the energy. Because these outer, outer shells are more energetic states. So the electron needs to absorb energy, absorb photons, in order to get excited and have more energy. And in fact, if it absorbs enough energy, it actually gets free from the proton. But let's not talk about that right now. If an electron is excited, is able to absorb a certain photon, it may jump right here to level four. It will, however, stay there for just a short period of time before it decays again. When it decays, it's possible that this electron will come to energy level three or two, or directly to energy level one. And if you notice, now this electron needs to get rid of the energy in order to come to a lower energetic state it will then emit photons. In fact, photons of exactly the same energy as it had to absorb before in order to be excited. Now, how can we use this to know about the chemical composition of, ob of celestial objects? Well, these wavelengths are discrete. These energies are discrete. And a certain energy occurs only in certain transitions of, the, of one specific element. So this is like a fingerprint of, of a hydrogen atom. If we observe any of these lines or combination of these lines, we know that we are observing hydrogen out there in the universe. Similarly, other atoms have their own fingerprints, their own signatures, their own, uh, their own energy so levels associated with it. So we're observing the emission lines or the absorption lines we can know what object is out there in space. And that tells us that all the objects that are in space are made of the same elements that we observe right here on Earth. That's very powerful. We compare what we observe from celestial objects with what we observe here in our labs, and voila, all the elements that we find there are the same elements that we see here. The little detail is that we humans know how to make different elements synthetically that are not found out there, but the reverse is not true. All the elements that we observe in celestial objects are matched to objects that we, are matched to elements that we observe here on Earth, and therefore we can know what each star is made of, based only on the light that it emits or absorbs. I almost forgot an equation. I'm sure you would miss it very much. So the energy that a photon releases or absorbs, emits or absorbs, is given by this little formula. Energy equals H, which is a constant, times the frequency. Or, uh, no space, energy equals H times C over so that tells you the wavelength and the frequency associated with the photon that it's emitted.
Thanks for watching. See you in class.